Uh, good morning, everyone uh, in Taiwan. It's my o'clock, so we start our um, lecture to be given by Dr. Martin Cordina. And his title is Where is the Water? Uh, Recent Studies of Carbon Monoxide Rich Comets, which is a very interesting topic because it has to do with the, uh, the origin of the solar system, how the planets and planets were formed. And we, we will obtain this information. We can only obtain this information from the study of small bodies like comets and asteroids. But let me say a few words about uh, Martin himself. Um, Martin, uh, Martin uh, is a research associate professor at the um, Department of Physics, uh, Catholic University of America in, in Washington, DC. He obtained his uh, PhD in astrochemistry from the University of Nottingham in 2006. And he now is a full-time researcher on the astrochemistry and planetary science at the NASA, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And Martin's uh, research work uh, focuses on to understand the chemistry and physics of solar system bodies. That means, um, I mean, that means the comets and, and asteroids, interstellar clouds, and circumstellar environments. And he used a combination of ground and space-based observation data combined with uh, detailed computer simulations to more or less to analyze the data. Uh, from the study of the original evolution of matter from interstellar to planted phases. And uh, he hoped that he will help us to understand the, the chemical conditions that led to life in the, in the universe, which is a great, great topic and big topic. Okay, Martin, all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Wing, and thank you to the seminar uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some of my research here on cometary science. Yes, so um, yeah, I'm happy to present my research, which is a collaboration between um, lots of uh, people in various countries that you see here. And we've been studying um, comets at radio and submillimeter wavelengths to understand more about their um, chemical and physical composition. And as Wing said, um, what can comets tell us about um, the origins and the conditions during uh, the formation of planetary systems? So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about carbon monoxide rich comets, which are an interesting way to sort of study um, some more unknown details about comets in, in uh, a regime where the outgassing is not dominated by water, which is the typical uh, dominant gas from, from comets. Um, before I talk about the research, I'll give an introduction for those people not so familiar about comets. And um, after that, I will go on to talk about two different research projects looking at uh, comets at radio wavelengths, including one uh, very special object, which was the first interstellar comet to I Borisov and um, some exciting results we got on that comet using ALMA. So uh, comets in our solar system are, um, most, most of them are, are found in a region called the Oort cloud, which is um, a spherical uh, cloud of comets um, at distances of a few thousand to maybe a few hundred thousand astronomical units from the sun. So it constitutes the very outer limits of our solar system. And in fact, uh, all cloud comets can be found at distances up to around half of the distance to our nearest star, Alpha Centauri. So it's a huge cloud of objects uh, as, um, of the order of a, a trillion uh, comets believed to be inhabiting the Oort cloud. And uh, we don't see them until they get perturbed from their location in the Oort cloud um, and start to fall in towards the sun on a um, elliptical para uh, parabolic or sometimes hyperbolic orbit. Um, there's actually a, a couple of different kinds of reservoirs uh, of comets because some also originate from the Kuiper belt and um, these then go on to become the Jupiter family comets, which uh, orbit um, at much smaller distances from the sun with periods of a few years compared to all cloud comets, which when they get onto elliptical orbits could be on um, quite long periods up to tens of thousands of years. Um, so why do we want to study comets? Well, they're fascinating objects and really unique in the solar system because of their um, unique history and the fact that 
they uh, are believed to be minimally processed since their formation um, and ejection from the inner solar system. And uh, therefore, they contain a pristine remnant or fairly pristine remnant of uh, their composition. Um, and this, therefore, you know, studies of that composition can therefore tell us about the processes going on when the comets formed um, in the proto planet, uh, the proto solar accretion disk. Um, different physical and chemical processes like uh, infall from the interstellar medium, um, accretion shocks, thermochemistry, photochemistry, ion molecule chemistry, and various transport processes in the disk uh, result in the, the um, composition of the comets. And uh, therefore, studying those uh, com compositions uh, provides us with insights into all those different processes that went on in the uh, early formation of our of our solar system. Um, in particular, the uh, chemistry of the mid-plane, which is a very difficult region to observe around other stars. Um, comets contain a mixture of materials from different radii in the disk. Uh, st our studies show that they contain um, ices, a volatile component, so things like water ice, methane, CO2. Um, in addition, there's a dust component, and uh, the, the dust components show evidence for high temperature um, processing near the sun, whereas the volatile ices, particularly the, the extremely vol volatile um, carbon monoxide and methane, um, which uh, don't freeze out until very low temperatures. So that, that the presence of those species in comets showed that comets must have formed at quite large distances, or at least a significant proportion of the ice in comets uh, was accreted at large distances from uh, the sun. And if you look here at some um, physical models for the protosolar disk, you see that these solid lines show two different physical models, an older one and a newer one. And the temperature drops with distance from the sun, and as it drops below um, the various um, freeze-out temperatures of different molecules, then they will accrete into the uh, nucleus of the comet. So we know that because comets contain a lot of carbon monoxide, uh, a lot of the ice must have accreted beyond this CO ice line at distances of uh, 20 or 30 um, astronomical units from, from the sun. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, it's very difficult to observe protoplanetary disk midplanes. If we look to uh, what ices we can see out in space to try and get an understanding for cometary uh, origins and what ices are present in the interstellar medium. Uh, we can look at infrared spectra of um, protostars. So this is a, a Spitzer space telescope spectrum um, of a, a massive young stellar object. Here you see the picture on the right, um, imaged by Herschel. And we see in the spectrum the imprints, spectral signatures, of these different ices, CO, CO2, methane, um, and uh, hints of other molecules as well, perhaps methanol. Um, but, you know, we can, so we can observe those ices in the interstellar medium, but if we look at a protoplanetary disk where planets are actually undergoing formation, if we want to understand what the conditions are like in this region where the planets are forming in the midplane of a protoplanetary disk, you see in this um, optical, Infra and infrared image is very dark in the disk midplane. Very few photons are escaping. So it's almost impossible to do spectroscopy of that disk midplane. And so this is where comets are extremely valuable because studying those uh, cometary ices allows us to infer the, um, the ice composition in that protoplanetary disk midplane region, which is uh, obscured due to a lack of photons escaping. So how do we perform these these kinds of um, observations of comets to, to understand the uh, chemical compositions. Well, uh, the nucleus is essentially frozen at large distances from the sun. And as the comet comes in under gravity, um, as it gets within a few astronomical units of the sun, it's the, the surface becomes warmer than the sublimation point of the different gases. And uh, they start to sublimate and form a coma like this. Uh, this is comet C2020F8. Um, and uh, this was a nice comet that, that came through a couple of years ago, very bright, and uh, produces the coma here and, and the tail as it comes around the sun. So um, the, uh, as we observe the comet, we see uh, multiple different 
gas and dust components coming off as a result of sublimation. You see a dust tail, um, an ion tail, and uh, this sort of uh, quasi-spherical coma that surrounds the nucleus and is in fact um, quite dense neutral gas in the middle and it, it becomes a, an expanding exosphere that then becomes ionized and can form a bow shock as it encounters the solar wind. Um, but uh, as you see on the right, this is a sequence of uh, channel maps obtained with, with ALMA of the um, HCN line. And uh, you're looking through in velocity slices through the, the HCN distribution. And it's actually, um, you know, very nice uh, kind of spherical distribution um, showing that we're probing with radio astronomy this inner um, gas coma. And uh, the point is, once we obtain the coma composition, then we can infer the composition of the nucleus. Um, because there's relatively little, we've never been able to really cut the comet in half and sort of have a look. And, you know, although we, we had the Rosetta lander, um, Philae kind of did more of a bounce than a landing. And um, there's still a lot that's unknown about the interior structure of comets. Um, so remote observations still have a, a lot to say about um, what is inside the nucleus. Um, so the, really the coma is my area of interest and uh, here you see um, an overview of the different uh, chemical and physical processes going on in the coma as the uh, gas sublimates from directly from the nucleus or perhaps from some icy chunks and grains, icy grains that get released along with dust. Um, these expand out and are subject to a, a wealth of different um, physico-chemical processes. Um, predominantly involving uh, solar radiation and uh, collisional processes, electron impacts, this kind of thing. And these result in um, spectroscopic emission. So as a result of collisional excitation, the uh, rotational energy levels can become excited and populated, uh, which can then lead to um, rotational emission that we can detect in the radio, solar pumping of the uh, vibrational energy levels leads to fluorescent emission, which is detected in the infrared. Um, and there are various other photo dissociative excitation, uh, dissociative electron impact excitation that give rise to uh, emission in the optical UV. And then uh, even uh, X-ray emission can be observed from comets as a result of charge exchange from highly ionized solar wind particles colliding with the neutral coma. You then transfer an electron to the uh, solar wind, which uh, radiates from a high energy state to produce X-rays. So cometary spectra are extremely rich and can really um, be an exciting thing for an observer to, to look at because there's just such a wealth of interesting emissions over a range of different wavelengths from the uh, x-ray and ultraviolet all the way up to the radio as you see here and this is a synthetic spectrum um, uh, which shows uh, these kind of processes in the end you'll see this spectrum published in um, the comets 3 book which is a big book about uh, comets which is going to be uh, released by arizona university press sometime in the next year or two um, so you can learn more about these different emission processes in that book but um, the region that i'm interested in the relevance to this talk is the radio Submillimeter region where we see these pure rotational transitions of, of different molecules. Uh, and we can derive the column densities and the, the temperatures of the gases and the gas production rates. Um, so, with uh, modern detectors and spectrometers, um, you can do uh, some interesting um, observations, such as spectral imaging, where you, you isolate a spectral line and you, you generate an image. In, in that spectral line. So we can get images of the different molecules as they, uh, as they leave the nucleus. And here is the Hartley, an example of the Hartley II um, observations by the epoxy uh, uh, space mission, which visited um, comet Hartley II and took close up images. And you see some really interesting um, uh, gas distributions like the emission of carbon dioxide from the sort of small end of the comet uh, water vapor being emitted from, from the waste um, and organics sort of showing an asymmetric uh, distribution. Um, so uh, yeah, this is providing us really interesting information about the, the composition of the nucleus and showing that it's not uniform, that there's different parts that are rich in different, um, different uh, molecular ices. 
So how could we understand a bit more about the history of comets and where they came from? It's interesting to, in the first instance, compare um, comet ice compositions to um, interstellar clouds. So here you see a pie chart showing um, from infrared observations of protostellar envelopes that the uh, fractional distribution of the different molecules in, the, in uh, interstellar ices and you see that interstellar ices are just like comets. They're water dominated. They have a significant component of CO, carbon monoxide ice, carbon dioxide, um, and also quite abundant are methanol, ammonia, methane, and formaldehyde. And these are ex the exact same species that we observe to be abundant in comets, slightly different uh, fractional abundances, which is not surprising considering how much the protostellar envelope gas gets processed as it collapses down to form a protoplanetary disk and then the comets are formed out of that. So in some ways it's surprising to see um, just so much similarity in the cometry and uh, protostellar envelope ice compositions. So this hints at um, a genetic link, if you like, between interstellar and cometary ices. So if we study these ice abundances in detail, this can uh, reveal the extent of ice processing as, um, as the comets are accreted. Um, on the right, you see there's a diversity, you know, there's no one comet that exactly matches this template. It's, uh, it's an average over the cometary population. And in fact, each comet is different. There's a diversity of different um, molecular abundances where uh, in each comet you observe. And you see on the right, the histograms showing um, different abundances of different gases on the x-axis and uh, the number of comets. So you get these distributions um, showing that, that, that not all comets are the same and that there is this diversity there. And understanding that diversity is, is also going to shed light on the um, formation conditions of comets. So actually, um, it's non-trivial to to go from an observation of the coma to understand the composition of the nucleus. Um, and uh, as I alluded to before, um, different molecules sublimate at different temperatures. And so as a comet comes in from large heliocentric distance, um, it's very cold. It's at a temperature below the CO sublimation temperature. And as it comes in, it moves up this curve, gets hotter and hotter, and uh, that allows progressively less volatile species to sublimate, ammonia, HCN, methanol, and finally water begins to sublimate once the comet is within a few AU of the sun. Um, so this issue, uh, this fact makes it a little difficult to necessarily um, make a, a direct link between the observations of the coma and what's in the nucleus, because you have to ask yourself, is the um, sublimation fully activated. Um, if water sublimation or methanol sublimation is not fully activated, then uh, you're going to get a different abundance um, of all the other species. Um, so, and, and this is uh, really displayed in detail on the right in this plot we call the Christmas tree, which is thanks to the Madon group, Nicolas Bivet et al, who have observed um, uh, comprehensive radio survey of molecules in comet Hale-Bopp, which was the very bright comet in the 90s. And it was able to be observed at very large distances. And you see that the different molecules have different abundance slopes. So the water falls off more quickly, water being traced by OH, which is the photolysis product of water. Um, the production rate falls off very quickly with heliocentric distance, whereas CO falls off less quickly. And the same for the more volatile species. So we have to be able to understand this kind of behavior to really understand um, the properties of the comet nucleus and, and keep it in mind when we when we try to interpret our abundances. Um, a great example of uh, this behavior is Comet 29P, swassman wachmann one which is an extremely um, carbon monoxide rich cometary coma. And it goes through repeated outbursts every few months. Um, the, the activity of the comet increases and then goes back down again. And you see that on the right, um, the magnitude in the, uh, the white circles um, goes up and down over time. And uh, the, 
blue squares show the carbon monoxide production rate, which also uh, shows these great fluctuations. Um, but overall, the carbon monoxide production is extremely high in this comet relative to water. And that's because um, the, the comet is quite far from the sun, around six astronomical units, where water cannot, uh, uh, the, the, essentially the water um, is not, uh, the, the water act, uh, is not fully activated, the sublimation, um, because the uh, comet temperature is below the water sublimation temperature. Some of it can still sublimate. It's it's uh, it's not a linear process. It's not a um, it's not, it's not a, an abrupt on-off process. It's it's a gradual onset of of activity of the water with distance. But the CO is fully activated where the water is not because it's too cold. Um, but this is not the only story. Um, there are some other interesting uh, effects going on which can help, uh, which can um, add complexity to this question of, of what is the intrinsic abundance of a species inside the nucleus. This plot shows uh, comet Garad, uh, C2009 P1 Garad, um, observed by Fager et al. 2014. Um, and uh, this plot shows lots of water production measurements. And I draw a little line here so you can just to guide your eye to see these water production rates. And the water did something interesting as the comet came in from uh, distance from the sun. It approached the sun at perihelion. And as it started to get really close to the sun, the water production, instead of increasing uh, like it should, if the temperature is going up and up, you should expect more and more water, it started to go down. And in contrast to that, the carbon monoxide uh, production just kept on going up and up. Um, so in the end, we, we had a comet with um, a carbon monoxide to water ratio that, that looked like it's starting to approach unity. And uh, that's not related to the sublimation uh, temperatures because the water sublimation is fully activated. And so the interpretation of this data is that there must be some heterogeneity inside the nucleus. The nucleus itself must have water-rich regions and carbon monoxide-rich regions. And what seems to have happened, therefore, is either we lost, you know, there was sublimation going on and the comet was coming in and we started to lose this um, layer of water ice on the surface, maybe, or there were water rich patches that sublimated. And um, but the CO, the carbon monoxide ice was maybe more evenly distributed and um, continued to sublimate away as expected. And it's possible that there were seasonal effects as the comet came around the sun it's possible that it, it started out at one orientation, maybe there was a water-rich region, and then it moved to the other side where that water-rich region then went into shadow. Um, and uh, that could then explain the drop-off in the water abundance. So um, yeah, it's, there's, there's interesting uh, physics to consider as we try to interpret these comet observations. So um, I've given you a lot of background information there, um, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end about, about comet science in general, but just to summarize, uh, we have uh, a, a nucleus in the center, um, about a kilometer in size, and a, a coma, which is maybe up to a million kilometers in size, which allows us to get uh, good observations with our ground-based facilities. Um, ion and dust tails can be even larger or longer in extent. Nucleus contains a mixture of ice and dust in a around roughly, it's different in every comet, but something like a one-to-one -one, uh, mass ratio. And the dust is uh, silicates and, and carbonaceous particles, whereas the ice is dominated by water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and a menagerie of other exciting, weird and wonderful molecules that I have not got time to, to talk about today. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the, the reason for studying comets is, is to gain more insights into the conditions uh, present at the uh, dawn of our solar system, therefore to understand the ingredients for planet formation. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, there's still a lot of uh, things we don't know about how the uh, the chemistry was and physics was proceeding at the dawn of the solar system. And uh, we can study comets to help elucidate that. But to, to really expand our knowledge in new directions, it's interesting to observe the sort of more unusual comets which can challenge our understanding. And one of these unusual comets 
is uh, this one called C2016 R2 Panstars. The, the numbers that I'm giving you of these comets, if you're not familiar, it's the discovery year. Um, and um, yeah, and the name of the discoverer in brackets and uh, an alphanumeric designation. So this is a very interesting uh, comet, very exciting um, because it's so uh, different in appearance to typical comets. Typical comets tend to appear kind of greenish um, as a result of strong uh, CN emission in the green part of the spectrum. This comet was very blue. And so immediately from observations, you can see there's something strange about this comet. Um, that uh, makes it very worthy to study, to understand about the diversity of comets. It's one of the most un uh, chemically unusual comets ever observed. And um, you can see here the optical spectrum, the, re uh, the reason I said why it's blue. It also contains, uh, in addition to CO plus, it contains N2 plus lines. Um, here you see a high resolution spectrum of the CO plus band with all the different rotational lines in the electronic transition band assigned there. Um, so yeah, these, uh, these CO and N2 gases have very um, uh, low sublimation points. So they sublimate at low temperatures and that's why we prefer to them as hypervolatile because they're extremely volatile. The volatility is how easy it is to get that material from the solid phase to the gas phase. And so these, these kind of molecules, um, they like to come out of the ice at, at, even at very low temperatures. So they're the hypervolatiles. So to understand um, more about the, the nature of this comet and the, um, the carbon monoxide and to understand the, the outgassing processes. And, um, you know, it's not often that we see such a, a carbon monoxide rich comet and carbon monoxide, although it's one of the more widespread molecules in the galaxy, it's one of the sort of less well studied molecules in comets because um, it has quite weak radio emission lines. Uh, so it's interesting to, to study in more detail to try to understand more about the, the nature of carbon monoxide in comets. So we performed observations using the James Clark Maxwell telescope on Mauna Kea um, using the HARP submillimeter receiver, which has extremely high spectral resolution. And um, this kind of radio spectroscopy is, is really unique in that it allows us to, to see the, the detailed Doppler shifts from this high spectral resolution. We can see the Doppler shifts of the gas and uh, understand the dynamical motions um, in addition to very sensitive uh, mapping capabilities. The comet was observed quite far from the sun. It didn't actually get very close to the sun in the end, um, but even at, at these uh, quite large heliocentric distance of about 2.8 AU, um, it uh, was producing a good amount of CO gas. And here you see on the right that how the spectrum evolved with time uh, in, um, from uh, mid-January to the end of February, to early February when we stopped observing it. And the, uh, the overall CO abundance didn't change too much with time, uh, at least the, the line strength. So we um, took the time average and Doppler corrected these all to the, the rest frame of the comet. So you see them at zero kilometers per second. And we see a, um, a nice asymmetric spectral line profile. And this asymmetry is telling us that the gas moving towards us is more abundant than the gas moving away from us. And um, that's a geometrical effect due to the fact that the sun is uh, more or less behind us when we're doing these observations. So this is consistent with the comet producing gas more towards the sun where on the side of the nucleus that's hotter compared to the, what we call the night side of the nucleus on the other side where there's less gas coming out uh, with the positive Doppler shift. Um, to under, to uh, determine the carbon monoxide production rate, we have to do some detailed radiative transfer modeling um, to convert this line strength into a production rate for the molecule of interest. We can use a simple HAZER model, and uh, this is the formula for the, the density of the coma as a function of Q, the production rate of the molecule. If it's expanding spherically, you have this um, one over R squared term with the velocity, which is more or less constant. 
and an exponential decay term for the photolysis of the carbon monoxide molecule. And then we do the um, radiative transfer to produce a, a line profile. And you'll notice that obviously the spherical um, assumption is poor and not, does not provide a good fit. It's normal uh, in cometry science to assume a spherical coma. So here we see, thanks to the very high resolution of this data, that that assumption is, is very, really not good in this case. So what can we do to improve that? Um, we can go over to a three-dimensional radiative transfer model and start to uh, try out different distributions for the outgassing. You know, we have to use some sort of um, intuition about you know, the fact that we believe the outgassing is stronger close to the sun and assume some sort of functional form for the uh, production as a function of azimuthal angle away from the sun is the observer angle here. Um, and, you know, you see a, a sink type um, um, variation in azimuth at the production rate produces a much better fit. Um, but if we start to do some ad hoc geometrical models with a, a conical jet facing the sun, um, with a different production rate in the jet compared to the ambient coma, and we can allow the ambient coma to expand at a slower rate than in the jet. If the jet is 0.52 kilometers per second um, outflow velocity and the ambient coma is 0.25, then uh, we produce a, a model, spectral model on the right, which is in much better agreement with the data. Um, so that's quite nice. You can kind of go on and on refining these models to within the, the limits of what our data allows. But ultimately, you get to the point where your, your observations don't provide a good constraint. So we have to go with the simplest model that provides a good fit to the observations. And in fact, um, going to more complex models is not really statistically justified. So this simple two-component Sunward Jet um, model provides a, a very good fit to the data. So we're happy with that. Um, don't want to go into too much detail about the rest of the modeling, but uh, the LTE assumption is no good in comets. It's commonly assumed when you analyze um, data from interstellar clouds or planetary atmospheres that the gases are in thermal equilibrium. And this allows us to then uh, do quite a simple calculation to determine the line strengths. Um, but um, you can't do that in comets because uh, the figure I, that I showed with all the different radiative and collisional processes that we have to consider. So we have to consider the detailed balance of collision rates between the molecules causing excitation and radiative uh, relaxation rates. So we then have a set of couple differential equations for the energy level populations um, of the molecule, which need to be solved in order to determine the amount of emission from the molecule from a given energy level. So it gets quite involved. And uh, yeah, um, you can ask me more about that later. It's a new model that we've um, been working on and hope to make publicly available soon. Um, so yeah, the, the least squares fitting results give us a, a production rate for CO. Um, and. Uh, and so that's sort of one of the main uh, results of this study is that we were able to get this sort of more accurate measure for the carbon monoxide production in this comet. Uh, we also did the, the uh, mapping with the JCMT harp instrument. And uh, you see on the left, a map of the distribution of the carbon monoxide in the vicinity of the nucleus. Um, and uh, we can then compare that again with our radiative transfer model and see if we get a good match. And if we do, then we have a good understanding of how the gas is being released from the nucleus. Actually, you see that the contours are a little bit larger. The outermost contour extends a bit further than the outermost contour of the model. These are um, on identical flux scales for the model and the observations. Um, so in fact, what we believe is happening is that there's some production of carbon monoxide from some other species in the coma that's causing it to be more abundant in the outer coma than, than we expect. Um, one idea is that CO2 is being photolyzed. That's a, an obvious thing to think about. Um, and, if, and once we include CO2 photolysis, we get a better fit of this, um, of this outer contour. So more, more, CO2 being, more CO being produced at large radii. Um, and if there's a, just a CO shell that, that arises as a result of 
um, maybe modulations in the um, production rate of the CO if it goes through outbursts that then move out to form a shell, then that can produce a similar um, effect. Or, or if, actually, if you if you do something to slow down the coma as, as the uh, gas is expanding, they then start to bunch up and that produces more emission at larger radii. So we can investigate these different um, uh, hypotheses in detail by comparing the um, spatial profiles with our models. But um, we can rule out the CO2 as a possible cause of the additional CO by comparison with the uh, Spitzer CO2 observations. Actually, Spitzer is not high spectral resolution. It only observes CO and CO2 at the same time. So these images, it's difficult to disentangle. Actually, if CO2 was, was abundant, then uh, it, would, it would dominate um, the, uh, the emission in these images. Um, so this, these images are believed to be mainly uh, CO. Um, so there's actually not enough CO2 to, to, to cause uh, a significant enhancement. So we rule that out. We have time variable observations, actually. Um, you know, we observe maps on different epochs and we don't see any significant changes as a function of time. So we rule out time variable outgassing of this comet. Um, deceleration is a possibility, so we can't rule that out and uh, sublimation of long-lived icy grains in the coma seems plausible. It's interesting that the um, Spitzer image shows this ring here in the, in the CO um, and also a sort of a jet feature. Um, and uh, this ring coincides with the approximate radius of the ring that we derived from our previous analysis. Um, so yeah, it, it, it seems to be consistent with production of carbon monoxide at quite large radii from the comet. Um, we did some observations to try and pick up other molecules. Um, it's, we got a pretty, uh, well, I'd say a little bit of a depressing detection of methanol here from averaging multiple lines, but it, it's something like four sigma detection. So um, it's uh, reasonably secure. So we believe that there's a methanol signal there. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't detect any other molecules with the JCMT. And actually, this is interesting because it shows that, um, you know, HCN and formaldehyde were, were uh, not very abundant compared to CO. So we can combine our observation of CO with the other observations that were made of this comet using different instruments. This table is from McKay 2019, and he used IRT, IRTF um, infrared telescope. And uh, comparing our CO production rate to the water production rate derived by um, McKay using uh, optical spectroscopy, um, we find that the CO to water ratio is incredibly high in this comet, 170. And uh, usually CO is just a few percent of water. So the, res the end result of this is that carbon monoxide in this comet is 3,000 3, times greater than your typical Oort cloud comet, um, which is uh, really incredible. By far the highest um, CO abundance observed in any comet by a long way. Um, other trace species are also unusually abundant. The methanol 160 times that found in normal Oort cloud comets. Um, HCN um, slightly overabundant, methane quite overabundant and formaldehyde moderately overabundant. So the, the, uh, the summary for this R2 pan stars is that, yeah, it's, it's a very peculiar comet. Um, to have such a large amount of CO, you see in this pie chart here compared to water, um, you have to start to wonder um, how did that happen? And uh, here you see a histogram of the, again, showing how much of an outlier this R2 pan stars is. Um, so People have postulated, was it an alien uh, or, you know, interstellar comet perhaps that came in from a different planetary system and that could explain why it's so unusual. Um, perhaps it's a piece of a larger body, you know, uh, differentiation occurs in planetary bodies when uh, different ices migrate as a result of thermal processing beneath the surface. You could form a CO rich region and impact could then release that. Um, it seems a little bit contrived, perhaps uh, unlikely, but then this is an unusual comet, so it's possible. Um, or maybe just some very unusual um, gas chemistry in the protoplanetary disk could produce such an unusual CO abundance. Um, I should talk about uh, the um, 
the fact the possibility of a insulating crust on the surface of the comet which allows the uh, which actually prevents the heat from penetrating into the surface so as a result of um, an insulating crust as you go away from the sun this is from the models of schmidt and marburg which uh, model the thermal penetration um, into the comet nucleus with distance the as the comet comes in um, and uh, the temperature goes up it takes longer for the water sublimation to to reach to, for, it takes longer for the water to reach the sublimation point uh, which um, you know could basically suppress the water production so this means that you know if that water production is suppressed then it, it, it throws more questions on the the actual understanding of the intrinsic nature of our two pan stars maybe inside the nucleus it's not that chemically unusual but maybe just the water production is being suppressed and once you suppress the water production you probably suppress a lot of our gassing of different molecules which are associated with the water and uh, that leads to um, that could lead to the chemical peculiarities that we see so as i say r2 pan stars was observed quite far from the sun at 2.8 au where water activity is uh, known to be low but the um, CO to water ratio was 37 times higher than any other comet seen to date, including comet Hale-Bopp and W3 Christensen observed at similar heliocentric distances. So that then leads to the question, really, where, where was the water in this comet? Was it hidden beneath the surface somehow, or was it just not there at all? Um, and uh, so, you know, this, this then, this diagram shows um, what I'm talking about a little more, little more illustrated where we have uh, incoming solar radiation and an insulating crust. If the CO um, and the water are in different phases in the interstellar medium, we see uh, an, a, um, an apolar ice phase, which is rich in carbon monoxide and CO2, and a polar ice phase rich in water. And uh, we know from um, astrochemical studies on Earth in laboratories that methanol tends to form along with the CO and, uh, and the CO2 ice. So if methanol is mixed with the CO ice and uh, there's an insulating crust that prevents the water ice from sublimating, you know, basically the, the comet starts to heat up, but not enough to sublimate the water ice, then maybe the CO and the methanol can, uh, can still sublimate. Um, while these species associated with the water ice in this polar phase um, the HCN, the methane, and the formaldehyde can potentially remain trapped. So this is just one idea for um, explaining these peculiar abundances in R2 pan stars. I don't think I have time to, to start to explain um, uh, all the detailed chemical physics going on here, but uh, basically different species um, can start to be released from the ice um, uh, as the ice warms up. So, you know, this picture is consistent with methane being uh, fairly enriched because methane must be above its sublimation temperature, but even if it's trapped in water ice, some of the methane can still sublimate. And the same is true for formaldehyde to a lesser extent. And then the HCN maybe is not quite reaching its sublimation point. That's why it's a bit less enriched than the um, methanol and the formaldehyde. Uh, more of these kinds of experiments in, are needed in the lab to really understand what happens when you start to warm up these mixed ices. This is an ongoing uh, area of research. So I, I give my conclusions about R2 pan stars. Um, extremely high CO, N2, methane, methanol, and formaldehyde outgassing, but extremely low water outgassing. Um, and uh, little is really known about how comets trap and release gases if the water is not sublimating. We don't really have this information to understand uh, comets in this regime. Um, so uh, we need more observations of, of comets and studies of these polar and apolar ice phases, ice phases in the laboratory um, so that we can then start to really understand if it's reasonable to have this um, polar ice phase in comet R2 pan stars containing water, HCN, formaldehyde, methane, but they're all sort of locked together below the sublimation temperature of water while the CO and the methanol can still um, can still sublimate.
Um, but we may just need different uh, um, ideas for how the comet formed because uh, you know the abundances could be could be the nuclear abundances, but more observations of similar comets um, are needed. I'm going to have to very quickly talk about the second part of my talk here. <laughs> if I can have a few minutes. Um, we uh, have been monitoring the skies for unusual comets, and we got some very unusual comets a couple of years ago. The uh, first apparition, as far as mankind knows, of interstellar comets coming in. Uh, interstellar comets were predicted, they were believed to be present, but until you observe them, you really don't know. And we got two very nice interstellar objects in three years. Um, we're waiting for the third one. In October 2017, we had one eye Oumuamua, which came in um, uh, and uh, really uh, surprised people. It was faint and it was only detected as it was leaving the solar system, so it was difficult to study. There was no detectable outgassing from Oumuamua, um, at least spectroscopically. Borisov, on the other hand, a very different object. It was, it was larger um, and it had a, a dusty and uh, gas-rich coma, which allowed us to, um, for the first time, the opportunity to study cometary ices from another planetary system. And uh, there's Borisov, who discovered it with his um, amateur telescope. We performed ALMA observations using the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. Uh, in December 2019, and uh, we targeted various molecules, CS, CO, HCN, methanol, um, which are believed to be some of the strongest lines in comets. We knew the comet would be weak, so we, uh, we wanted to detect um, the stronger lines. And um, we didn't know if we'd detect anything because it was a, a faint comet, um, but uh, I was really uh, amazed when we got the data and uh, we got the detection of CO and HCN. And what was immediately very surprising, I mentioned earlier that carbon monoxide tends to be weak, it has weak lines. And so to see it as strong as HCN, which is normally the strongest line in comets, you see here in the middle, the detection of carbon monoxide on the left, and the detection of hydrogen cyanide on the right. And uh, this, this really showed us there was something peculiar about this comet to I Borisov as well, compared to our normal comets. We did our normal radiative transfer modeling to get the production rates of the carbon monoxide, the HCN. We compared with um, observations uh, in the UV of the water. Um, and what we found was that the HCN production rate was relatively normal compared to comets in our solar system, but the carbon monoxide was very elevated. And here you see the plot on the right of the carbon monoxide to HCN ratio to I Borisov, uh, obviously an outlier compared to our normal comets not as much of an outlier as R2 pan stars, it must be said, but still, apart from R2 pan stars, 2i Borisov was one of the most unusual comets ever seen. Um, so, you know, again, we can talk about whether this um, carbon monoxide elevated abundance is a intrinsic um, to the nucleus or not. Um, the fact that CO is there, well, we can say a few things, you know, from one, from, from one observation, uh, we can make a statistical argument that it may have originated from a young low mass stellar system, which are statistically the most abundant stellar systems. For CO to be present, the temperature must have been low, which it is in such systems um, because the stars are faint. And the temperature of the um, comet must have remained less than 25 Kelvin, the CO sublimation point throughout the life of the comet. If there was an insulating crust, of course, as mentioned for R2 pan stars, um, then that could reduce the heat penetration, preventing the, H, the water and the HCN from sublimating. So it's worth considering that. Um, and uh, the, also the possibility of a layered nucleus, as with Comet Garrett, the different uh, layers of the comet, one may be richer in water and one may be richer in carbon uh, monoxide. And uh, so these, you know, these, could, these could vary with time and, and a seasonal effect to illuminate carbon monoxide rich part compared to the water rich part. And we should also consider the exciting possibility that what we're seeing really is a carbon monoxide rich comet. Um, and this can start to tell us some very interesting things about the uh, system from which Borisov originated. If it was a, a carbon monoxide rich disk, 
could this have implied less conversion of carbon monoxide into more complex molecules? Maybe the, the chemistry was slowed down. Um, and maybe there were some interesting processes going on in the, the protoplanetary disk, such as the diffusion of carbon monoxide across the CO snow line. I don't have time to talk about this now, but if you do models, detailed models for protoplanetary disks, you find that you can produce um, carbon monoxide in, in the gas near the snow line, which then moves, diffuses out over the snow line, freezes onto the dust and gives an enhanced CO abundance. So there are some models for this being, being generated at the moment. Um, so yeah, just to quickly summarize uh, about Borisov, um, it has a higher carbon monoxide to HCN ratio than measured before in any comet at a similar distance from the sun. At this two astronomical unit distance, the nucleus um, activity should have been fully switched on. Water should have been uh, vigorously sublimating and HCN. So the fact that we observe this peculiar um, high CO abundance should be indicative of the carbon monoxide abundance in the nucleus. So it's interesting to then wonder about um, whether, you know, how how distinct to I Borisov is um, and whether it's indicative of uh, the uh, kind of CO abundances that we would find in other um, protoplanetary disks in the galaxy. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's going to be interesting to observe more um, interstellar comets to, to really characterize them and get a better understanding of whether Alien comets are really different to our own comets. Did our own solar system evolve in a different way um, to, to solar systems around uh, to planetary systems around other stars? Um, but before we can really make such uh, inferences, we need to really understand if the abundances that we're observing are really representative of the, abund the abundances in the bulk nucleus. Um, what are the effects of an insulating crust, and uh, can that affect the um, gas phase abundances that we're observing and at what point in a in a comet's orbit is it really fully activated and fully sublimating so then we can really understand that the abundances we're observing represent those of the nucleus um, it'll be interesting to do more observations of interstellar comets and uh, look at other possible chemical processing of the interstellar comets as they travel through the interstellar medium and but before we do that we need more um, comet observations and uh, I have a JWST program to do just that. So we are waiting to activate this JWST program so that we can um, understand about the uh, um, abundances of the chemical precursors for life in other star systems. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Martin. It's very, very comprehensive talk. And, um, we are inviting questions from the audience. And uh, so you're in trouble because uh, uh, Lin Chi Hong is asking you questions. Chi Hong. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me, Professor? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. So, um, okay, so I have two questions. So the first question is, uh, because as we know, when a nucleus they produce the okay. So when a, the first question is that when a nucleus produce the primary coma, and it's a primary go, coma or get a thicker, do this coma absorb or reflect some of the sunlight, reduce the solar radiation to the nucleus, and keep the size of the primary coma or stable for a short period of time? So that is the first question. Um, yeah, I can answer that. Um, you know, it depends on the activity of the of the comet. If the comet is producing a lot of dust, then the dust will uh, absorb or reflect uh, solar radiation and prevent that solar radiation reaching the nucleus. But to be able to do that, you have to have a very active nucleus. The nucleus has to be uh, already warm to produce that much dust. But, you know, different comets contain different amounts of dust. So, you know, I believe that it, it, it could be possible for a comet to produce enough dust to start shielding itself, but uh, it'll be interesting to, to study that some more. Okay, thank you. So my second question is, uh, as we know, the different molecules have different decomposition critical temperature, such as water molecular are 2000 degree, and so on, and others the 
we're gonna matter that amino acid it might be degree on 200 degree or more so does that mean the amounts of different organ or chemical substance in the coma change as the comet get closer or faster from sun because that means the coma temperature will be changed then maybe yeah. that will be appear different uh, molecular so it's that's a possible thank you yeah that's a very good question um because of course the coma temperature does increase as the, the comet approaches the sun um the however the, the molecules in the coma are not absorbing that much thermal uh, radiation the density is quite low um so actually the, the the molecules in the coma undergo adiabatic expansion as the gases expand so these gases actually cool um I think as the comet comes very close to the sun, you should get some solar heating. Um, but actually, it's more the solid particles that get heated and the nucleus. The gas itself does not. But So if, if the molecules that you're interested in are in small particles, they can become heated by the absorption of radiation. Um, and uh, then these kinds of processes you're talking about may be important, the thermal degradation. And, you know, we believe that macromolecules may be present. You know, this is molecules which are intermediate in size between small, the small molecules I've been talking about in this talk and, and dust grains, some kind of very large molecules. They can absorb thermal um, uh, infrared photons and uh, become heated up and start to break down. Um, so, yeah, that, that is possible when the molecules are large enough. Um, okay, uh, there's uh, uh, Dr. Lin, Zhong Yi Lin. Uh, you have a question? Please. Hi, I have a question about, we, we know there, there are some hyperactive comets. Can we call this hyperactive comet as the, you say, chemical uh, peculiarity comets? And... Um... These kind of hyperactive comets, typically it's, it's the water that you observe, unusually high water. And, and I, as far as I know, the abundances of other molecules are not particularly unusual in the hyperactive comet. So, you know, there's a, a recent paper by Derek List, 2019, looking at the deuterium. So deuterium uh, in water, the D over H ratio is quite sensitive to the thermal conditions. Mm -hmm. So this molecule seems to, to be different in the hyperactive comets, but I'm not aware of any strong evidence that hyperactive comets show different abundances of different molecules. But that would be very interesting to study some more. Okay, and another question is, uh, can we, can we, do we know the R2 pen star and the, the inter uh, two two eye bodies of the the, the, the information of the D two H ratio. We got this data for for these two comets. No, unfortunately, in both these comets, it was very difficult to detect water, and the the HDO that you can use to get D over H is at least a thousand times less abundant than water, more like ten thousand times less abundant. So it's just impossible in a very weak comet. But having said that, with next generation, more sensitive telescopes, maybe James Webb telescope or some future telescope, may be possible to detect um, HDO in more of these uh, fainter uh, water depleted comets. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions? Any other question? Um, maybe I've asked a question. Um, Martin, there is uh, the, the newcomers, presumably they're coming from the odd car, right? Um, and the odd cars are generated by, by, uh, by ejection, scattering, gravitational uh, scattering by the uh, uh, giant planets. Uh, let's say by, by Uranus, Neptune, not so much by Jupiter. So, so the, the, the origin, you know, the source region of those odd cloud comets, presumably are within maybe, maybe uh, 20, 30 AU. Mm -hmm. And that's very, uh, and, uh, and how can you introduce a CO snow line there? 
I mean, that, what I'm saying is that the so seal rich come in principle, they are part of the, they will be part of the odd cloud population, which originated from the from the giant planet uh, region. Uh, and then uh, you can more or less uh, have a model on the on the temperature profile. Uh, and then they think, then you ask how, how can you have a seal rich uh, uh, objects, you know, for the Earth? Well, I, I find it difficult to envisage having a CO um, abundance that's larger than the interstellar CO ice abundance. Because in the interstellar medium, you have the very low temperatures, the abundant CO that freezes out. I, I find it hard to imagine that you could therefore have CO, you know, even, even beyond the CO snow line, I don't think it can get larger than 30%, something like that. Mm -hmm. Just because of the the interstellar um, abundances, so I, I believe that comets are formed outside the, um, the CO snow line um, because they, they must be. You know, uh, where was the position of that CO snow line uh, in the protoplanetary disk is a, a good question, and I think that disk modelers still like to argue about the exact location of that CO snow line. Somewhere twenty to thirty AU seems reasonable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and other things that you have a steel rich uh, comet. Uh, um, do you also observe a steel two rich comet? <laughs> so it was the Japanese Akari survey that was um, made huge progress in our understanding of the the CO two. And uh, if we talk about this polar ice phase rich in water and the apolar ice phase rich in CO two and CO, then uh, it seems like the, the CO2 and the CO, you know, might, might show similarities if they're mixed together. Um, but the CO2 is very difficult to observe. So, you know, it's actually not something that I've looked at. Um, okay. So yeah. uh, if you have any information about that, I'd be interested to hear. <laughs> right. I just want to get something out of you. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, any other questions? Uh, I can see some comment expert here, and they uh, they they don't ask questions. Wendy, Wendy, you want to ask a question? Wendy, are you there? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is a good Wendy. chance to ask Martin a question. Hi, Martin. This is Wendy. Uh, good so, evening. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's morning now. <laughs> 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 so. Uh, so you mentioned you have you proposed uh, three mechanisms to to the uh, to explain the high CO abundance. So I'm interesting. Uh, it it seems to me like the the only possible way to tell the difference is like from the lab work. So I'm interesting to know if. Any other observation can help you to tell the difference for the three mm -hmm. force mechanisms. Yeah, just like uh, every good astrochemistry problem, it's a combination of observations, laboratory, and theory that will help answer this question. You know, as a, as I said, like understanding more about sublimation from mixed ices, I think is is crucial. But also, we can attack from the observational angle just by doing more detailed observations of comets as they go from through different distances. Because most comets, you know, it's difficult. They come quite quickly. You get maybe one opportunity to observe, and you just get one measurement in time. But as we know, the more comets we observe over a long period of time, the more variations we see. So, but we don't have very many of those kind of observations. There's a nice comet at the moment. Uh, K2 pan stars, and this has been coming from a long way away, and um, and it's still not reached perihelion. There are lots of observations over a long period, and if we start to see these trends in the abundances, we can understand: is this, you know, unusual to see the abundances change, or is it is it quite common actually? And what happens when the comet is very far away and the water is not really sublimating? Do we observe? A very different chemistry in the coma, and we still we still don't really have those answers. So with more observations, we can have those answers, and then we of course need the theory 
to understand the observations. So it, it, it's a combination of these different approaches. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chihong, Lin Chihong, you have a question? Uh, sorry, Professor, I forget to ask another question. Yeah, so my number three question is, uh, why do some comets have the slender coma while others look like a flurry hairball? So could the shape of the coma and the brightness of the coma be related to the chemical property of this comet's release? Is that possible? So this is uh, my number three question. Yeah, because that we know that like, new OS comet help both comets there uh, when they are close to the sun, but their comet shape, their coma shape still look like different. So what will be this happen? Um, I, I didn't quite catch the the first part of the question. You say, did you say a slender coma versus a, a spherical coma? Oh, sorry, sorry, I repeat again. So why do some comets have slender coma while others look like a flurry hairball? So could the shape and brightness of the coma be related to the chemical property of the comet's release? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. I think the coma morphology, though, when we observe um, in the optical, uh, which I assume you're talking about optical observations, um, it, the, the morphology is often uh, quite strongly affected by the dust um, at the dust morphology and the dust morph the dust can interact with the solar wind you know the dust uh, experiences radiation pressure and so it can travel away from the nucleus so then that depends on the dust properties the dust albedo um, the dust size distribution will then affect the shape of the, the, the coma and then any species that are sublimating from the dust will then show a distribution similar to the dust so I think that the, the, the shape of the coma is probably telling you more about the dust rather than the, the gas composition. But then, you know, the volatiles can be present in the dust, so it, it's related. So yeah. is the molecular escape speed will be changed, the sh uh, scattering rates of the, this uh, comet? Like we know the hydrogen hydrogen molecule that has the highest escape speed and the oxygen is the heavier, so that has a lower escape speed just like this. So will the escape speed affect the shape of this uh, comet's tail? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the overall size distribution of the coma is different for different species, the, the velocity being uh, a factor in that, as you, as you pointed out, you know, once the coma gets into the free flow regime where it's no longer collisionally dominated and the different species can okay, move at different uh, speed. Dr. Zhong Yilin here, uh, just write with them, right? Um, and Martin, thank you so much because it's getting late on your end. Uh, it's um, <laughs> already the is past 10. And thank you so much for your courage in giving a talk. It's such a late hour. <laughs> and it's a very nice talk and we learn a lot. And, uh, and I think that there's a, 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 a now they're getting more and more data on the co rich comets. Uh, I think there, there may be a very interesting story that you could build. And look, we look forward more now to your work, your great work. And thank mm. you so much again. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you.